Hello there, one and all, and welcome to episode 341 of Love at First Scent with me, Persilaise, coming to you live, as always, on YouTube. Welcome to the episode, whether you're watching live or you're watching the recording, and we have got a first comment. It's one fragrance at a time who says, first one here, I think, well, you were certainly the first one to leave a comment, so well done. Lindsay says, yay for a live, so excited to catch it. Paul Perfermo says, hello. SMC says, woo, hello, always a treat to catch a Persilase live, and Rachel is here as well saying, yay, you're very, very welcome. Please feel free to leave a comment, ask a question at any time, whether you're watching the live or you're watching the recording, I try to answer all of them as quickly as possible. If you haven't already subscribed to this channel, please do consider doing so and then click on the little bell so that you get notifications of new videos. Okay, what have we got for you today? Well, first of all, I am very, very, very pleased to say thank you very much for noticing, Rachel, yes, that this is one of my favourite signs that winter is actually going to end at some point soon-ish and spring is on its way. Look, we've got, um, it's interesting you say jonquils, Rachel, because we, we would say um, daffodils, right? And we've got a hyacinth there, which is very, very beautifully scented. So not long to go before the, the, the official first day of spring. Um, what we're doing today is presenting another top 10. I was actually, um, I had I had originally planned for this slot to be the sort of regular review slot, but I had so many of you uh, get in touch with me asking for another Valentine's Day video. Um, I, I wasn't going to do one this year because I did one in 2022 and I'm pretty sure I did one in 2021 as well. But tons and tons of requests from you. Um, and I thought, gosh, you know, you, you're all romantics. You obviously like to, to do the whole Valentine's Day perfume thing. Um, and why not? But we, we need to give it a bit of a theme, okay? So I thought that the theme for this year would be to try to come up with some scents that convey a sense of old world glamour, a sense of old world sophistication. Well, actually, no, more glamour than sophistication. But the point is that these can't be old scents, okay? So the challenge I set myself for this theme was that they all have to be relatively modern releases. And I kind of had this cutoff point of no scents that are older than um, 10 years. And, and actually, I think there is only one on here looking at the list that is uh, 10 years old. One, I suppose some people could argue that one is 11 years old, but the version that I've got for you is is, is less than 10 years old and most of them are quite a bit more recent than that so that that's the that's the, the that's the sort of framework so relatively recent modern scents that might be suitable uh for valentine's day if you want to capture a sense or convey a sense or project a sense of old school old world glamour and um if you have got any sense that you would recommend that fit that bill so remember they mustn't be too old but they kind of need to feel like they have a sort of retro vintage feel i would be very interested to know what they are what are people saying so far smc says it's far too cold in new york for spring to be here yet the weather here has been warming up ever so slightly but i think a cold spell is on the way again. Uh, Rachel says, giving retro vintage feels my favourite, that kind of thing. One Fragrance at a Time says, Nuit Noor by Ellie Saab. Okay, is sort of old world glam to me. Can't wait to see your picks. I don't know that one. I wonder if it's one of those um, exclusive Ellie Saabs that I never really got a chance to try. Uh, okay, I, I, I think we need to get going, really. And, I, and, and we ought to start with the one that perhaps best sums up or encapsulates what it was that I was trying to capture. And it also happens to be the oldest one. So so uh, two good reasons to, to, to start with this one. Um, Janish says, hello all, I, or, or is it Janice? Says, I can't believe I'm watching live. Well, you are watching live, I can assure you. Um, Iris Poudre comes to mind for retro glamour for me, says SMC, that kind of thing. Okay, but but Iris Poudre isn't, isn't on here. So from 2013, composed by Frank Volkel. This is um, Ilang 49 from Le Labo, okay? Uh, I've talked about this one on this channel before. I reviewed it when it came out. Um, and and this, this scent is the very sort of definition of a modern perfume doing a retro old school thing, but in an interesting way that, that immediately lets you know that it isn't actually old, it isn't actually vintage. Uh, Mr. Aristeas, a stunning shirt, Mr. P. It looks like Venetian lace. Um, but it, thank you very much. It's it, well, it, clearly you can see it's not lace. I mean, it, it is cotton, but but old world glamour, maybe something like that. Okay, so let's have a spray. 
and I will promise not to keep rabbiting on because we have got 10 to get through. Um, where are we? Superstitious by Frederick Mal, says Gino. That would have been a good one. It's not on the list. Actually, there isn't a single Frederick Mal here, but that would have been that would have been a good one. Although I've always found superstitious a bit hard to take. So this is Elang49 from Le Labo. And I've probably I've probably told this story on this channel before, or maybe written about it on the blog. So apologies if you've heard it. But Madame Persolais, the long-suffering, eternally patient Madame Persolais, um, back in the day, uh, was known to have been a big fan of the original um, femme from Rochas. You know, the original scent composed by Edmond Rudnitska, which was. Um, which was, I think, even when it came out, a little bit of a retro sheep, a very, very elegant sheep. Um, and Ylang 49 came out, and I thought, gosh, this makes me think a little bit of the original fam. Why don't I spray some on a blotter and see what Madame Persolais thinks? And sure enough, she smelt it and she said, oh, there's something of fam about it. And it, 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 it completely sort of traces a line through um, peachy, fruity sheep, which I suppose means that it goes right back to Garla Mitsuko and, 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 and Koti's sheep. Um, and so it's got a very, very strong patchouli note. It's got a suggestion of uh, a, a sort of mossy note. It also makes me think to some extent of um, Yves Saint Laurent's Y or Y, you know, the, the that was, that was a beautiful sheep as well. Um, and yes, I know that it's called Elang 49, but we know that we need to take Le Labo's names with a very, very, very large dose of salt. Um, although there is a, a kind of white floral element to it, but um, it's, it, 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 it's, defi it's definitely sort of fruitier rather than indolic. So you can kind of see the territory where Elang starts heading into kind of leafy banana, um, those sorts of those sorts of facets. Um, and then the one thing that I've also always thought about it, which I consistently think every single time I smell it, is that there's something very, very beautifully feline about it. Um, and I'm looking, I'm looking at this the, the sense that I've got here, and and a few could be seen in feline terms. In fact, one is very, very overtly, you know, it sort of name checks uh, uh, a, a feline animal. Um, but but I, I can't sort of present these to you in terms of cats because I don't really know very much about cats. I'm not I'm not a cat person particularly. But there's something there's something slinky about it. There's something purring about it. There's something very, very nuzzly and cuddly about it, but also something very fiercely independent about it and almost um, haughty. Um, and it, it's great. I, I have no idea how it does for the brand. I don't I have no idea how successful it's been. Uh, for all I know, it is still available. It is still part of the lineup, um, but it absolutely deserves to be. Um, because it's great, it, and one of the best things that Le Labo has done. People are guessing that the other feline one is going to be Le Lyon. Now, no, actually it's not. Um, I could have included Lyon, Le Lyon here, because that in many ways is the sort of definition of old school glamour as well, but I thought, well, we've kind of talked about Le Lyon a lot, but there is another Chanel, there is another Chanel, but I won't tell you which one it is. Um, what are people saying? Uh, greetings from Chicago, says Victoria, warm wishes, the same to you too. Um, haven't tried Le Labo yet, says Gunnar. So Santel 33, Patchouli 24, Elang 49, Gayak 10, and this one. Um, I would say, well, th this one is Elang 49, right? So you need to try this one. Definitely the Patchouli, definitely Santel 33. Um, and SMC says, gasp, it's not Le Lyon. No, it's not. No, it's not. Um, Lindsay says, Dawn Spencer Hurwitz, the American indie perfumer, does old world glamour very well. Good tip. Thank you very much. Rachel recommends all of Les Andemodable. Yeah, I know what you mean. Uh, 31 Rue Cambon from Chanel. That is also not the Chanel on the list, although very, very good choice. La Douleur Exquise. And we do have something from Les Abstraits, but it's not La Douleur Exquise. So um, we need to we need to move on. Uh, so th th this is kind of what we're talking about, okay? So this this sets the tone.
for where we're going with this. It pays a massive, massive homage to the past. And yet, I think through the kind of the, the 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 metallic note there's something about the top here that is very very silvery m metallic mercurial mercury like rather than mercurial um that kind of immediately makes you think that it's a 21st century scent that that's the effect we're going for and it is unquestionably sophisticated um rachel says then it must be misia no it's not misia either. this is going to be interesting perhaps perhaps you're not going to agree with the choice okay so let's carry on. Let's carry on. And actually, we've talked about Les, Ab Les Abstraits, so let's let's come out with the one that is on the list. And I thought, if the whole point is to talk about scents on this list that are new, let's go for the very, for the, the, the absolute latest one from Les Abstraits. This is Descendre. So this is a 2023, uh, yeah, did I say that right? 2023 release, composed by... Um, Antoine Lee, as are the two others from this range. This is, of course, the brand that was founded by Eugene Nizik. I um, hope I said that. I can't remember whether I said that correctly. Uh, the perfume critic behind You Smells Good. He set up this brand and he also very kindly, just a few days ago, gave some, up some of his time to appear on this channel for an interview. This is his latest scent. It's only officially been out a couple of weeks, I think, if that and it is well worth your time but it also just so happens to fit the bill for today perfectly so let's have a scent um or a sniff i should say i'm really taken with this one actually i'm really taken with it and i've enjoyed wearing it so far and getting to know it um now this is to, to me, to my nose, it definitely kind of goes into leather territory, but it feels like a leather that is somehow emerging very, very organically from a forest floor, um, which is the kind of surreal image that perfumery is so brilliant at, because, you know, obviously that, that would never happen in real life, I don't think. And yet, here, you can absolutely believe that you're in the middle of quite a dark forest, but not so dark that you can't see the green uh, of the leaves on the trees, and 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 the, the trees are full of leaves. Um, there are leaves on the floor as well, there's moss on the ground, but also there are these sort of patches of leather amidst the soil. And so you're on this kind of almost patchwork, leather, mossy, earthy forest floor. Um, and Gino, Gino's put it well, actually. That's a very good description. I just see you saw a description saying, I recently sampled this. I get some green figgy leaves with some ashtray. Green, but also ashy. It's, it, it's, it's, it's definitely sooty as well, isn't it? Um, really, really, really nice work. And again, it has that retro vintage feel, you know, it could make you think of things like, I don't know, Bondi perhaps, you know, uh, shades of Antaeus, maybe, maybe there's some isoputyl quinoline in here that's making me think that, you know, al along those sorts of lines. Um, it's, it's, it's assertive, it's bold, it's uncompromising, and yet it's also got soul and there is something very, very, very impassioned about it, which, which makes it a really, really great um, companion to the Lilabo. Rachel says the green and leathery aspects of Descendre are gorgeous. The cinder ash smoke is very retro. I'm glad you agree. And, and this is another, another, another really, really great piece of work, I think, from Antoine Lee and Eugene. Um, let me just label the blotter. It, it's interesting, though, considering why uh, all three of the releases from Les Abstraits so far have had a kind of vintage feel. Perhaps not so much the second one, Bellam. Um, and, and you don't know whether that's because the creative direction has just taken the composition in those ways. You know, maybe that's what Eugene wanted. Or whether it's also because when you're a perfumer like Antoine Lee, who's decided that they're going to become um, independent, you perhaps don't have the same access that you used to 
to the to the to the to the very very modern newfangled aroma chemicals. Although I'm sure if anybody could get access to those sorts of things, it would be Antoine Lee. Or is there a third reason that if you're somebody like Eugene, if you're somebody like Antoine Lee, trying to make perfumes that will stand out in an independent brand like this, you will try to include more naturals. And so maybe just the fact that a greater proportion of naturals was used in the past, that immediately also makes us think, oh, this has a vintage feel to it. It's, it's an interesting question to consider, an interesting um, question maybe to put to, to Antoine Lee one day. Rachel says, the chocolate of Bellam keeps it less retro for me. Yes, I know what you mean. So there we go. The Two kind of excellent sort of companion pieces here to set the tone for what is for what is to come. And I think actually in that kind of independent mode, Perhaps the third one I should do. Yeah, let's do this one, actually. So this is from 2017. Um, oh, Pradeep says, Eugene self-admittedly loves grandma cells. S smells. <laughs> smells. Well, there's nothing wrong with grandma cells. <laughs> smells. So 2017, from as independent a perfume house as you could possibly get. This is from Papillon, okay, the the British English perfume house founded by uh, Liz Moores. She is also the perfumer. All of them have so far been made by Liz Moores herself. This is Dryad, okay? Which again, I think is one of the best things that uh, she has done. So this is like one of the best La Labos. I'm not gonna say this is one of the best Les Absolay because there are only three so far anyway. Um, th and gosh, that Descendre blotter is really, really strong. So let's have a spray of Dryad. Dryad is so strong, says DJ. Um, and Natalia says Dryad is gorgeous. Right? I'm, I'm, well, you know, strong and gorgeous um, are not mutually exclusive, right? And this this was one of the first ones that came to mind, okay, when I thought of putting this list together, because this, this, is, this is old world, old school glamour, but done in a, in a modern way. Let's have a smell. Oh. Yeah, see, this is interesting. This is interesting because, again, it's green, but it's very, very, very fuzzy, mossy, and it's got that kind of stewed vegetable feel to it. Oh, Gunnar says, you've used a lot of it. Yes, I kind of have, but I also got this bottle not entirely full. Okay, but but, but yes, I mean it, it is it is it is definitely a scent to be used. It's great, um, and again, something glinting, metallic. Um, I love I love as well how each of these three, in their own way, are. Uh, abstract, and again, we've talked about this a lot on the channel, but I suppose one of the sort of defining characteristics of more old world, old school glamour is this sense of abstraction. Um, we, we've said a few times that more modern scents tend to be uh, much more easily legible, much more figurative, much more obvious, um, you know, highlighting two or three prominent notes very, very, very overtly so that they can be easily identified whereas the past was much more about um, keeping things perhaps a little bit more opaque, more abstract, not exactly obfuscating things, uh, but, but, I, but I don't think wearers were so concerned about wanting to identify specific notes. It was much more about the sort of overall symphonic effect. Um, Rachel says, Dryad is gorgeous. Uh, her work does have a bit of vintage Garlin vanilla. Yes, yeah, absolutely would go along with that. And there is there is definitely, you know how um, Vol de Nuit with, with, its, with its galbanum note starts heading into that kind of, almost that sort of overstewed celery type feel. And I mean that in the nicest possible way. Um, Dryad very, very much does that sort of thing too. Um, and, and, and also smelling it now, I am reminded of, um, uh, Donka, or is it Donka Donka from uh, from Latizan Parfumer, the, the Bertrand Duchaufour scent, which, which also has this fuzzy, slightly sort of un, you know, five o'clock shadow type quality to it, um, 
or, or, or as my as my as my grandson says when he's sort of stroking my face, spiky. He says, "Why do you have a spiky face?" Um, and yeah, this this is this is this has got the, the the similar sort of thing. It's really beautiful, really really beautiful, and and technically very 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 well put together. And yes, absolutely, you're right. A, a kind of cross somewhere between Garlin and L'Artisan Parfumeur, which is um, a good place to be, right? Uh, what's everybody else saying so far? Eco Jock says, you mentioned a symphonic effect as opposed to the modern hits approach. Yes, if you like, that's a nice way of putting it. Sharon says, I love Dryad, also love her tobacco rose. Yes, lots and lots of people love that one. Is that vegetable stew smell wearable around other people, says Gunnar. See, I need to be careful when I use these sorts of descriptions. because I know, I know that that sounds off-putting, but it's not off-putting at all. So what that will come across is something mm, that's a bit sort of mossy, earthy, green, I guess. You need to smell it for yourself, okay? You will you will not smell like a cauldron, rest assured. Um, but do try to get a sample. Do try to get a sample. Dryad is a bit too stewed for my liking, says Woozy. I think Spell125 does the green in a more practical way. I don't think I've smelled that one yet. Lots of people like that one. Hera by Papillon is vintage for me, says Rachel. Hera also smells like old world glamour, says Gino. So there you go. Obviously another one to try. Right. Um, where should we go for the fourth one? Okay, well, I just mentioned this brand, so let's do let's do this one. Where's my bottle of it? Okay, here we go. This is from 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 2018, so it was released a year after the Papillon, and from L'Artisan Parfumeur. This is Mont de Narcisse, composed by Anne Flippo, who many years ago did a lot of their scents, and then sort of that they moved on to other people, but. This was great, and I'm pretty sure, if memory serves, that I included it on my list of the top 10 perfumes of that particular year when it came out. Um, one of the better things that we've had from Latizon for a while. Uh, Latizon, I suppose, was always hit and miss in the same way that all brands are ultimately hit and miss, aren't they? Um, but Latizon used to be much more hit than miss, but lately it seems to be getting a little bit more um, miss rather than hit. I mean, their their latest one, the the what was it called, so Soleil de Provence or something like that, would you know, really didn't work for me. Although I did love the um, the Potager series that they did uh, last year. Um, L'artisan sold their soul, says DJ. Well, I don't know if I put it quite like that, but I know why some people might feel that way. Anyway, Mont de Narcisse is a fantastic, longer-lasting alternative to Cuir d'Ange, says Woozy. I have never thought of it in those terms. Let's have a smell. <sighs> See, an interesting, because then, Woozy, you must pick up more of the leathery thing here, and whereas I, maybe because of the name, just go straight down to the sort of Narcissus, floral, jonquil-type feel. Um, I have a sample of Mont de Narcisse as Gunnar. I like it a lot. Yeah, it's really, really beautiful, isn't it? Um, it's it's one of those rare examples of a floral that somehow manages to completely evoke the flower itself and yet also conjure completely different abstract symphonic effects. You know, we're going to be using the, those words a lot. Um, and it 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 feels like you're coming across the flowers genuinely growing somewhere on some mountain. Was this the scent that was inspired by the Auvergne? I think it may have been by the Auvergne region. And it has got that kind of solitary, soulful, wandering around the mountains by yourself type quality. Um, and which of course then makes us think of Mr. Keats and and um his poem. I wonder if the, the and Filippo was aware of that poem when she um when she composed the scent. And yet there's also something very, very quiet and gentle and intimate about it. You can you can see the sun setting uh on these flowers too. And and all of that, I suppose, is that the, the, the floral feel, the vanillic feel, again, earthiness, mossiness, all of that is what gives it that beautiful retro quality, but this is this is perhaps um, 
less less brash than the other three you know less assertive certainly quieter um although it, you know it, it's it's no wallflower but 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 compared compared to these two it, it's certainly quieter um and it just shows when Anne Flipo is 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 at the top of her game there's very 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 few people who can match her for a kind of for for a for a naturalistic composition that manages to be both you know in, in the sort of solid floor territory but also heading into really really beautiful abstraction um it's great really really great uh one fragrance at a time says the first spray reminds me of leather car interiors and hairspray yet it's still so spectacular gosh i have not thought of these sorts of things in relation to this one at all narcissus can feel so vintage in my opinion says rachel yes you're absolutely right Woozy says, for me, on skin is much more of a leather than a floral. I find the Narcissus has leathery aspects that melt with the leather accord. And yes, Narcissus does have leathery aspects. Uh, Pradeep says, oh, sorry, you're talking about shopping. If only I were near a printon, says Joan. Um, yeah, well, we, we could all do with being closer to certain shops. Um, but it's great. It's, it, it's really, really lovely. Really, really beautiful. And... We're doing well for time because we're almost at the half hour mark and I'm going to do the fifth one. So what should the fifth one be? One Decisions, decisions. Okay, let's do this. Let's do this. This is, this is one that um, was just so knowingly retro and knowingly vintage. You could argue that actually this one doesn't even have much of a sort of modern feel to it. but I think it's maybe just got enough modernity in there to qualify for this. Uh, Rachel says, Mr. P, this could end up being my favourite list of the year. Gosh, OK. So this came out in, uh, where is my list? This came out in 2019, but it is no longer in this bottle because I think what happened is that it started doing very well for the brand. And so they decided to put it in the sort of more accessible bottle range from Tom Ford from 2019, composed by Antoine Mazondieu. This is uh, Beau de Jour. Uh, there you go, Woozy. Did you guess it before I showed it to you? Um, and this is, um, as, as you will know, this is basically um, an, an, an old school, out and out old school fougère. Um, but it's done really well. Uh, wonderfully kind of tongue in cheek. Let's, let's have a smell. Let's have a smell. Um, Yeah, and, and it's the kind of thing that I think can't help but put a smile on your face because it's just so cheekily retro and so so exuberantly and joyously retro. Um, it, it also makes me th th think, of course, a lot of Jacques Cavalier's uh, Rive Gauche pour Homme for Yves Saint Laurent, which, again, even that one, I think, when it came out, had a kind of vintage quality to it, but... There's no way that could be included in today's list because that is well over 10 years old. Um, a nod to Zeno from Davidoff, says Nick. Uh, yes, yeah, absolutely. Would, wouldn't disagree with that. Although Zeno, wasn't Zeno a bit sweeter? I don't know. I've got an old bottle of Zeno. I'd need to, I'd need to re-smell it. Um, Rachel says, Tom Ford, sexed up vintage. Well, yes. Although, you know, there was no shortage of that in the 70s either, was there? So, um for the for the few of you who may not be aware, the fougère is a, is a, is a type of perfume which um, didn't originally start out as being um, exclu ex exclusively masculine, but over the decades um, suddenly started appropriating these masculine codes uh, to the point that is it's now considered in some ways to be the most masculine of perfumery genres. It's it's what some people will call the kind of barbershop scent. Um, if you think of uh, things like the original Brut from Fabergé, you know, that was a really, really out and out uh, fougère, but then so is uh, Garlin's Giki in many ways, that is a fougère. And the, the thing about a fougère is a sort of interplay between mosses in the base and lavender and herbal notes and possibly geranium in the, oh, Sharon, thank you very much. I've just noticed that, that's, that's very kind, thank you. Um, lavender geranium herbal notes maybe a slight suggestion of uh, white florals in the heart and so they create this when it's done well they create this really really beautiful seamless hole that somehow tends to 
that somehow manages to convey both strength and tenderness. Now, unfortunately, a lot of the time fougeres are done really, really poorly. And a lot of modern scents out there are released as fougeres and they're just crass aberrations. They are horrible because they tend to be really, really scratchy and and abrasive with their woods. Um, and, 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 and so I should have said, you know, a good dose of bergamot citrus at the top as well. Um, but when they're done well, when they're done like Jiki, when they're done like uh, Geranium pour Monsieur from Frédéric Mal, then they are just the quintessence of sophistication. Um, somebody's saying anything's better than Rive Gauche pour Homme. Do you not like it? I love Rive Gauche pour Homme. Um, um, and this one very, very much goes into the past. Um, it, it's the, the 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 patchouli is really strong. The the lavender is quite quite sort of strident. Um, the coumarin note. I should have said coumarin as well. Obviously, tonka bean. I'm forgetting all of my perfume lore today. But coumarin is very very important in the construction of fougere as well. It's a substance that occurs naturally in tonka beans, and it gives fougeres that that kind of distinctive hay like tobacco quality. Um, and 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 this one is great fun. It's great. It's great fun. It's it's a kind of Robert Redford um 21st century style type scent and and um i'm not surprised that it's done well for the brand because um because this is the kind of thing that tom ford does best you know old-fashioned but with enough twists to, to to bring it up to date okay so we have done five and we have just gone um over the uh, half hour mark, which is a perfect time for me to say that you are watching episode 341 gosh, of Love at First Scent with me, Persilase, and we're doing one of our themed lists. This one is for Valentine's Day 2023, and the idea behind this list is to present to you top 10 perfume recommendations that obviously will work for Valentine's Day, but will also convey a sense of old world or old school glamour, the caveat being, or the, the, the um, qualification being, that they all themselves have to be relatively modern perfume. So there is nothing on here that is older than 10 years old. I should also say, please do subscribe to my channel. If you would like to find out how you can support my work, you should find a link to my coffee page below. And also I am going to, sorry, this is a pain, but I'm going to have to start getting better at doing this. I meant to say to you, if you're enjoying the video, please, please like it, press the like button because apparently, and I'm so rubbish at self-promotion, so apologies, but apparently that is the thing that makes YouTube push the video to other people so that other people get the chance to see it and experience these wonderful perfumes as well. Here endeth the promotion. EcoJock says, Tom Ford mentioned that the 70s was a remix of the 30s. Yeah, he's probably right. And he loved the 70s, hence all the browns, oranges, and harvest golds in his Gucci collection from the late 90s. Good point. Rachel says, Sailors by the Zoo is a great take on Declaration, which is a great take on Eau d'Hermès. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Although, which one came first? Oh, no, Eau d'Hermès. Yeah, okay. Yes, yes, yes. You're, yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right. Um, have you smelled? Oh, Gunnar took out their... Com but yes, the answer to your question was yes. I, I, I had smelled that one. Right. Okay. What should we do next? Let's go... Let's go actually for another one that's in a similar vein to this, but rather than channeling 70s, it kind of maybe channels the 80s. And this is from this is from 2020, although it's only this particular version that came out in 2020. The first version of this perfume came out in 2016. So here's the revelation or the reveal. So from Marc Antoine Barrois, this is the X-ray version of B683. So the first version, which I guess was an EDP, came out in 2016, and then in 2020 he gave us the extrait. This is composed by Quentin Biche, as are all the scents from the uh, Barrois collection so far. Now, um, when I interviewed him on this channel, he was again another person who very kindly gave up some of his time and came on here for a chat. I asked him, or I, I, I tried to ask him, um, whether through all of his sense so far, he's kind of harking back to a sort of 1980s sense of masculinity, because I think you, you can sort of see that in all of the perfumes so far, but especially so in 
in the B683 and, and the X-ray. Let's have a smell. Yeah, there's... Caroline, that is very, very, very kind. Thank you so much. Um, and what am I meant to do? It says I'm meant to celebrate. I can't click on that, can you? So I think, because I've had a message here saying, celebrate the super chat from Caroline Muller. So I'm saying thank you. Is that, <laughs> is that what counts as celebrating it? Thank you very much. Very, very kind. Um, so this is this is very much um, in the sort of 80s mould of masculines. By the way, to go back to what I was saying earlier, I don't think he actually really answered my question head on, or, or basically I think he said that he didn't quite agree. But anyway, um, so it's it's woody, it's leathery, it's like a kind of quieter, sweeter, kinder Chanel Antaeus. The extra apparently has uh, an addition of a kind of um, oud note, which is, uh, I suppose, what makes it feel more 21st century rather than 1980s. Um, <laughs> Woozy, I've just seen your comment. It's made, it's made me chuckle, but um, I'm, I'm not, not, not going to read it. And it's, yeah, it's 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 almost it's almost like you know the the, the yuppies of the eighties or the or the the Wall Street heavies of the eighties. The Wall Street heavies of the eighties have have developed a bit of a soul in this scent. So they've got they've got the, the you know the braces, the suspenders, they've got the the shoulder pads, they've got the slicked back hair. Of course, I'm just picturing Michael Douglas here, um, but maybe maybe they're nicer. So maybe they're like. The, the Wall Street heavies who've decided to go and work for NGOs or somewhere in their in their older age. Um, and somebody mentioned Akigala Wood, uh, the Givaudan material that is so beloved by Quentin Biche, the perfumer. There is definitely a dose of Akigala Wood in here as well, um, but but not overdone, not overdone. So this is, this the, these two kind of go together, I suppose, in the sense of um, trying to evoke um bygone masculinity um yeah but and and it works really really well on skill skin it works extremely well on skin um okay we're down to the final four so let's go we we'll, let's go for one another one also done by monsieur antoine lee uh this is from 2016 from the brand set up by another perfume critic, another perfume writer, Barbara Herman's brand. She's also been on this channel. So this is from her brand, Eris. This is called Nightflower, like I said, composed by Antoine Lee. Um, and I adore this one, one of one of my favourites from hers. Um, and this, I suppose, is like an old world, old school, um, warm amber scent. Oh, Stephanie, thank you very, very much. This is this is very kind, folks. Um, I, I do I do appreciate it, and it's it's very very helpful. But um, I also I'm so get get sort of embarrassed when this kind of thing happens. So thank you, thank you, thank you, very much appreciated. But I will concentrate on the list. Um, Eris, do you think they're retro feeling? Says Rachel. They these feel so modern to me. Well, I, what about Green Spell? I mean, they, they don't all feel retro. I mean, I think Scorpio Rising, I suppose, was um, although, although that had a um, no. I, th I think I think I think a lot of them do have a kind of retro feel, and they they certainly highlight Barbara Herman's own love of retros. And this is ah, oh, I really really adore this one. And night flowers is is just is just the best name for it because it's like it's like those classic ambery scents. So I'm thinking of I'm thinking of you know your Chalamars and Ambre Sultan. It's like you've caught them while they're hibernating in the middle of winter. Um, so there is a kind of latent energy here there's a latent power um and and you get you, you you get suggestions of what that power you know what it might be like when it explodes and i guess that comes through the spices the the cardamom 
I don't know whether there's cinnamon in here, you know, that, that have a kind of strange, mysterious cooling effect, but you 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 feel the lava at the heart. Um, and yes, yeah, so I guess it's making me think of latency, you know, d d dormant volcano, some, some powerful beast hibernating in the middle of the winter, all of those sorts of images of things being caught on the cusp of on the cusp of erupting, on the cusp of exploding, on the cusp of waking up, um, lurking. <laughs> so um, flavor source says here and lurking, but but lurking is is a good word for this one actually. This is a this is a perfume that lurks in a way, lurks around, and then just pounces on you. Um, it's really really beautiful and a great example of you know creative director and supremely talented perfumer coming together and giving us something just stunning and so different from from. Eugene's creative direction on on Les Abstrait. Um, and I don't wear it enough. I absolutely don't wear it enough. Perhaps, but perhaps I shall wear this one this Valentine's Day. Um, um, what are people saying? Rachel says, we're getting a bottle of Lyris de Fa <laughs> I'm not even going to ask for that one. Thank you very much, but gosh. Um, uh, Woozy says, do you find similarities between Nightflower and Musque Ravageur? Well, I, you know, I've mentioned Shalimar, so I guess I would have to say that, yeah, I must do, because, of course, Musque Ravageur is a kind of modern take on Shalimar. Uh, Rachel says, I'm open to being convinced. Listening carefully, Professor. <laughs> well, don't worry, I'm not going to try too hard to convince you. Um, um, uh, to, to me, to me, there is, there is, a, there is a kind of retro to it there, I would say. Maybe maybe it's the, the, the good usage of, of the of naturals. Tomash says, today I'm wearing Kinesia 10. I love that one. A leathery beast. And I do not think Percy would give it a thought of included in his ongoing top 10 as it might bring one's relationship to a bit to what do you mean? No, but it, it can't be in here because Kinesia 10 is, you know, it's old itself. It is, it is, it is a vintage scent, but I love, love, love Kinesia 10. Absolutely one of the ones that I never, ever want to be without a bottle of. It's just fantastic. Um, right. I'm just trying to think of which one to end on. I think maybe I'll end on the Chanel just to keep the suspense going because nobody's guessed yet. But let's do the feline one because I told you a feline one was coming and somebody did guess this one. So this is from 2014. The original EDP of Cartier La Panthère, composed by uh, Mathilde Laurent. Um, I think maybe th this, this turned out to be quite polarizing at the time. Uh, I loved it straight away. For me, this really was a love at first sniff. And I love the fact that uh, Mathilde Laurent decided to do something so sticky, sickly, brave, bold, um, in, in a modern feminine scent. And I must confess, I did think that maybe it wouldn't last terribly long and that it would maybe die a bit of a quiet death, but it's still around. And I think it was a couple of years ago that uh, Cartier gave us a parfum version. They'd also done an X-ray. The X-ray was something else. That was beautiful. But but it, it it's kept going. Oh, better third. Thank you very, very much indeed. This is really kind, people. I really appreciate it. Um, the current parfum is juvenile, in my opinion, says DJ. Hang on, I've lost the thread. Do you mean the Cartier? Yeah, I, I think if you're talking about the one that is most recent and that they call the parfum, I'm not crazy about that one. I love the EDP. I loved the extra. And I'm pretty sure there was an EDT, which I think was okay as well. But anyway, let's have a smell. So this is... This is a gardenia. And of course, um, very, very few flowers are as vintage and retro and old world glamour as gardenia these days. You don't really get very many all out gardenia scents. But this is, this is a really, really dangerous feline, slinky Venus flytrap, honey gardenia. Um, I mean, the panther is just the most perfect image for it as well, because you, you, you imagine a jungle, you imagine a lush uh, tropical backdrop. Having said that, I have no idea whether that is the kind of um, environment in which panthers live. I don't know, but this particular panther does. Um, and it's 
oozing wickedness and stickiness and honey and tobaccoiness. Um, and, and it is this gardenia that is, you know, sort of constantly unfurling um, and just drawing you in closer and closer and closer and pulling you in and enticing you. Um, and it's great. It's great. And I'm sitting in what is at the moment a very, very cold room. And it's working really, really well in the cold because somehow the, the, it's, 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 it's heat is being tempered in a way that is really very, very, very attractive. Um, I remember when it came out, um, asking Mathilde Laurent if she feels that you can tell whether a perfume has been made by a, a man or a woman or whether it really matters. And she, her first response was that she completely dismissed it and said, you know, no, scents are scents and it makes no difference whether a perfume is made by a woman or a man. And, you know, we shouldn't worry about this and we shouldn't be talking about uh, having more perfumes made by women. Um, and, and I then sort of said, I said, but hang on, you know, isn't it significant, this is what I said to her, that, that, that she had chosen this to be uh, Cartier's next big sort of mainline feminine scent and that she, as a woman, was making a statement that this is how she wanted femininity to be represented in the, in the, in the early part of the 21st century. And then she sort of smiled and said that maybe I had a point because I pointed out that I didn't think that very many men would um, go for this as a kind of expression of femininity, and I think I think there must be something in there. I think there must be something in there about um, um, the the sex of the person that's that's composing the perfume. Um, Dimitri says, "My two favorite flowers and perfumes are carnation and narcissus. You can guess why." Uh, Gucci Rush was a great gardenia scent, says Eco Jock. Musk in Heaven says, recently got a four mil decant of Iris de Fath and got smoke by Acro for less price than the four mil decant. Well, yeah. uh, now should find something for the partner too for Valentine's. Um, and Chanel guesses are, so people are guessing 1957, Gabrielle Extra, number 22, Gardenia, Paris, Paris. I'm not going to say whether you're right or wrong now. Um, but let's move on and let's do this one. This is from last year. And this, I suppose, is in a way, um, I was going to say the cutest, the sweetest. It's That's not exactly right. I'll tell you what it is. So this is from last year, from Christine Nagel, um, Hermès Violette Volinka from the Hermès range. As regular viewers will know, I was very taken with this to the extent that I included it on my list of the uh, top 10 best perfumes of last year. Um, and it's not right to say that it's cute. Um, let me make some more room for it because we also have got one more. But there is there is something a bit more innocent about it compared to um, compared to some of the other ones on this list. Woozy says, "Do you prefer Violette Valinka over Cuir d'Ange?" I mean, okay, if we're talking about real, real personal preference, and if I had to have just one of them in my collection it would be Cuir d'Ange because just because I personally would happen to gravitate more towards those petroleum inflected type leathers. But that's not what this list is about. Okay, so this list is about scents that evoke some kind of old world, old school glamour. Um, and, and I think this one does the, the job very well. I remember what struck me most about Violette Valenka and, and Christine Nagel seems to be really, really, really good at this. She's pulled this effect off in several perfumes. Is this perfect balance, perfect equilibrium between the opposing forces all the way through the perfume's development. The other one of hers where she does this that comes to mind straight away is, is Cedre Sans Bac, also for the Hermesons, which has got this fantastic um, tussle between um, the, the, the cedar and the jasmine. And here you've got... Um, a beautiful interplay, it, it, and, and tussle isn't the right word because that's confrontational. It, it's just, it, it is balance, it is equilibrium between the violet and the leather. And so there are points when you think it's just going to go down that kind of sweet lipsticky violet feel, but then suddenly the, the leatheriness takes over and they just keep flirting with each other perfectly and complementing each other and balancing each other out. Um, it's, 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 it's just it really, really, really great work. 
Um, Amanda says, last time I went to Hermès, they were out of almost everything but Osman Thunan, su a supply issue, especially for Ambre Narguila. Oh, that's worrying. I didn't know that. Uh, and Woozy says, Agaraben is almost the opposite, where the two sides constantly mesh and clash, but it's done so well. Yes, and I love Agaraben. I love what she's done there. Uh, Woozy is Mr. Persilaser's perfect student, says Rachel. Actually, I think I am all of your perfect your perfect, your, per, ooh, where's the possessive there? I am your perfect student, or I'm your most, most um, biddable and grateful and humble student, because trust me, I learn um, a lot more from you than you do from me. Um, hmm. And Rachel says that Violet Velenka is genuinely polite and sensitive to its surroundings, softness of character. Yes, yes. And I think maybe that's what I was trying to say when I decided, when I described it as being sweet. Okay, we're down to the Chanel. Um, and this one is the one that originally came out in the form that we know it nowadays in 2012. But the reason why I'm allowing myself to include it on this list is because this version that I'm about to present to you came out in 2014. I don't think anybody guessed it, which I guess means that you're all just going to throw up your arms in exasperation and say that this is the most ridiculous one to include in this list. But I think it kind of works. So from 2014, this is the extra version of 1932. Did anybody guess 1932? If anybody guessed 1932, I missed it. Um, Eco Jog says, that is a perfect title for a romance. I'm your most perfect student. <laughs> that is pretty good. So let's pop the box on here. And as this is a Chanel extra, I think I will put some directly on skin, don't you? I think I think that needs to happen, right? Actually, let's put the let's oh, we'll put the bottle here eventually. Okay. So 1932 exclamation mark says Rachel just glad it's not 1957 <laughs> sent Jeannie thank you very very much it's me who should be thanking you but it's very very kind of you to do that um was 1932 poorly received says Woozy or was that 1957 I can't remember I, I, I now can't remember I have a feeling that I reviewed both of them but I can't remember which was the one okay yeah Oh, uh, Dimitri says 1957 is lackluster. Joan says, love 1932. Um, and this is, I'm, yeah, it's just reminding me of what I thought when I first smelt it. I think, I think it's the X-ray version of this that actually works best. I can't remember what I thought of the, because um, this is one of the last ones I think that came out uh, as an EDT because I think literally a year after it came out as the EDT, it came out as an EDP, and then all of the exclusives were turned into EDPs. Um, oh, Woozy says, I'm not a fan of 1932 personally. Oh, controversial. Who would have thought that the Chanel would turn out to be the controversial one? Well, we always have an outlier, don't we? E EDP is quite similar to 31 Rue Cambon, says Pradeep. Um, okay, but what this is, is one of those very, very kind of fluffy, powdery florals, and yet a powder that seems to also have in it flecks of wood, if such a thing is is um, can be imagined. I think 1932 is the one, and if this isn't the case, then this description is, is just completely redundant, but I'm pretty sure 1932 is the one that was inspired by a jewellery collection, and I think a lot of the jewels featured diamonds, and this was meant to be sort of flecks of light, um, little little beams of light catching here and there. And you do, you do get a sense of that, which I think comes through from the powderiness, from the kind of jasmine feel, from the woodiness. There's, there's a sort of sweetness in the vanilla coming through. I, I, thought, I thought this was one of the better ones, and I do think it works very, very well as an extra. And this one actually... There's a, you know, speaking of tussles between elements here, I think there's a real tussle between the old world glamour and the modernity, because there's something about the dryness and the woodiness that makes it feel very, very 21st century, almost a little bit like, you know, the, the woodiness of chance. And yet, of course, the powderiness, the sweetness, the aldehyde quality is what makes it feel quite retro. 
So there you go. I did not think that this would be the controversial one, but 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 turns out that it is. Uh, give it another go, Woozy says Joan. Um, reflection and refraction among veils says Rachel, which is which is beautiful. Yeah, there is something veiled about it, something gauze-like, isn't there? Seeing things through through semi-transparent surfaces. Hmm. It's one of the only powdery fragrances I enjoy, says Rachel. Gosh, now that's quite a statement. And we also had a very strong statement earlier from somebody saying that they didn't like it. So who knew that this was a bit of a polarizing Chanel? I certainly did not. And I've just seen the clock ticking and realized that I've already managed to go on and on like this for 55 minutes, which I think means we bring this video to a close. So thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much for all of the suggestions. Thank you very much for the support to everybody. That's really, really kind and completely unexpected, but always, always very appreciated uh, and very, very welcome. And I promise, promise, promise that uh, the next video we do, I don't know exactly when it's going to be then, will be one where we actually talk properly about new releases because I have had a few samples of new and newish things sent my way that I need to share with you. Um, but let's keep let's keep the romance and the love and the passion burning on this channel. Thank you very much for persuading me to do another Valentine's Day video. Perhaps we just need to do it as an annual thing, actually. So until next time, be good, and I will see you soon. Take care now. Bye.